Okay, can I get everybody's attention, please? Everybody sit down. Hello, my name is Rhonda Rohrbacher. I'm proud to serve as the New Hampshire State Coordinator for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for President. And I'd also like to recognize my fellow state coordinator, Eric Jackman. Yeah. And I'd like to recognize the Honorable Dennis Kucinich, former congressman. Longtime champion of liberty and the national campaign manager for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for president. The interest in this campaign has been extraordinary. And this historic pivotal moment starts right here in New Hampshire. So if you'd like to get involved, please see me or Eric afterward or visit Kennedy24.com. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Tucker. President and founder of the Brownstone Institute. And Dr. Tucker is a profound thought leader for many of us. And his writings helped me better articulate to my fellow pro-liberty friends why Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is the strongest choice for president for those of us who strongly value liberty. You know, you know a, a, a few minutes ago, somebody came up to me and said, hey, are you with the New York Times? I'm not, I mean, that's probably the worst thing that anybody's ever said about me. I, so, uh, we're gathered here on the month 40 after the lockdowns began. And we all know what that meant. It was the long, dark night of the soul. A lot of pain, a lot of suffering. There were many people at this event who were points of light. That belief in freedom, that belief in human rights, the willingness to speak, the courage to act. It challenged us all. Our speaker today is, for me, the strongest, brightest, most brilliant light of the last three years and three months. He showed us the way, he showed us what it means to have hope, what it means to have courage, what it means to have that sort of rigor and attention to fact. Um, and most of all, I would say that he has uh, borne a lot of the slings and arrows for a lot of us. I think we, we all owe him a great gratitude. This country owes this man a great civilization owes this man a great debt of gratitude. Help me give a warm pork fest welcome to a hero, a man of courage, the man of the hour, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I'm very, 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 very proud to be with a lot of people who value freedom in the United States of America. I had, um, in August of 2020, when the pandemic just started and they were just doing the lockdowns and all the other stuff, I was in, I went to Germany and gave a speech in Berlin. Uh, and the, the estimates of the crowd there were 1.3 million, and it was, it, was, uh, it was the most extraordinary crowd. It looked like Woodstock. There were people from, uh, there were people from all over Europe, people from every, the, the MC was a, a man from Ghana. Um, we had uh, Buddhists, uh, priests, we had Hare Krishna people. You have people from every kind of ideology, left, right, first time coming together and saying, you know, somebody is stealing our freedom. And this is something we all need to unite about. And 
the, the, the crowd, again, they said 1.3 million people, and nobody was wearing a mask. And that was, at that time, that was a, a kind of heresy. And, um, and there was an NBC crew from the United States there, and they were all masked up. And they said to me, why aren't you, why aren't you wearing a mask? Aren't you scared of COVID? And I said, there's things that I'm a lot more frightened about than COVID. <laughs> and, and, they, and they said, what is that? And I said, that, that would be losing my constitutional rights and having my children grow up in America where they don't enjoy the kind of rights that I took for granted as a boy. And we saw during COVID this extraordinary, um, this extraordinary thing happen to our country where all of a sudden people, they, they, the capacity, the fear, the orchestrated fear, almost discred dis disabled the capacity for critical thought among so many Americans, people who we loved, people who were family members, people who we grew up with and we all assumed uh, shared the same value systems that we did, but all of a sudden they were okay with censorship and the government began, you know, going through the, I mean, through the Constitution. They started out with the censorship, which they began very, very early. You know, I started encountering it by the end of January of 2020. Um, things that I said would disappear from Instagram posts. And by the way, I'm accused of, of passing misinformation. But I would, you know, misinformation as we know is just a euphemism for anything that departs from government orthodoxies, whether it's, whether it's, It had nothing to do with accuracy or inaccuracy in their nomenclature. And we know this because they acknowledged that in the Twitter files and they acknowledged that in the, you know, in that the emails that we now have between the government officials and, and uh, Facebook, where Facebook is saying, well, you're asking us to, um, to censor things that are true, uh, but that they, uh, that they may affect, they may dissent, be dissenting against government policies and they, uh, and they all agree that that's right. So um, we saw the, and, and the, the right of free expression, Hamilton, Madison and Adams all said we put it in the first amendment because all of the other rights are dependent on that. If a government has the capacity to silence its critics. It has license for any kind of atrocity. And, and that is what unfolded as soon as they found out that Americans would put up with constraints, with government ordered constraints on free speech. They began this attack, this assault against all the other amendments, all the other rights in our constitution. The other sort of second leg of the first amendment is freedom of worship. They closed down every church in this country with no, for a year, with no scientific citation, no due process, no notice and comment, public hearings, no environmental impact statement. And by the way, you can do things for emergency, but you can still go through the democratic process. You could still have the comment sections and public hearings and, and, uh, and environmental impact statements, but none of that was even tried. I've spent 40 years suing companies and agencies for trying to subvert or shortcut the regulatory process, part of democracy. You know, there, there was a big question throughout our country's history about whether regulatory agencies were even constitutional because they were outside of the democratic process. You know, the Congress, yes, can pass laws. The Constitution says Congress can pass laws. The court said, okay, regulatory agencies can pass laws, which is outside of the Constitution, but you have to incorporate a regulatory process, and it has to be strong, which means you have to do an environment, you have to do a, a public notice, you publish what the law is gonna say, so that everybody knows in the newspaper of records, in ways to calculate that every citizen who is affected by this new law will learn about it in advance, you give the public a, a period of comment. 
you do an environmental impact statement that outlines all of your scientific uh, citations and all of the expert opinions that underlie it. You look at the cost-benefit analysis to every sector of society. You look at whether there's alternatives that can accomplish the same objective that are less burdensome to the public. These are all legal requirements. And then you have a 60 or 90, 30, 60 or 90 day comment period in which the public, every member of the public can comment and all of those comments have to be responded to. Oh, for example, if, if there's a mass regulation and you know I own a kayak company and I say to the government, I can't force my clients to put on masks because it, it could kill them in an emergency. That, that would be the kind of comment the government would say, okay, then we'll carve out something for outdoor sports or something like that. That's why the government, that's why you have those comment periods. And none of that was done. And then you have a, a, an administrative fi finding that's published by the administrative judge. And then that's appealable. So the whole thing to, in a court, and up to the Supreme Court, so it's all incorporated in the democratic process, but in this case, it was all forgotten. And we just had one bureaucrat who had been 50 years in office and never been elected, who says one week put on masks, and the next week, or one week masks don't work, which he's saying in private and publicly, but privately he's advising his boss at HHS, don't put it on, they don't work. Oh, you know, later he said, oh, I just said that to, you know, to reduce the, the, the demand on masks. But he was telling that to his boss, you personally should not put on a mask because they don't work. Oh, um, so and he, he's a 50 year bureaucrat who's never been elected who then, you know, mandates all these diktats for the American people completely separated from the, from the democratic process. So after they did religion, and they went after freedom of assembly, which is the third leg of the First Amendment. We were all told to social distance from each other. And then they go after property rights. They closed 3.3 million businesses with no due process and no just compensation in violation of the Fifth Amendment. And then they go after uh, jury trials. Oh, here's what the Seventh Amendment says. It says, no American shall be denied the right of a trial before a jury of his peers in cases or controversies exceeding $25. There is no pandemic exception. They didn't put that in the United States Constitution. And by the way, the framers knew all about epidemics. There were two epidemics during the Revolutionary War. One of them uh, that uh, decimated the uh, malaria epidemic that decimated the armies of Virginia. And then a smallpox epidemic that actually took place in this state, Vermont and New Hampshire, with Benedict Arnold's armies that were on their way to Montreal. And they ended up taking Montreal, but having to leave because they didn't have the manpower to support the occupation. So we would have, Canada would have been part of the United States, but for that smallpox epidemic, arguably. And the framers of the Constitution knew all about that. So they knew about epidemics, and not only that, but between, between 1780 and at the end of the revolution and the ratification of the Constitution, there were, there were devastating epidemics in, almost, in every city in the United States. There were smallpox epidemics, yellow fever, cholera epidemics that killed tens of thousands of people, including family members of many of the framers of the Constitution. And yet, they did not put an epidemic exception in the United States Constitution. The Constitution was written for hard times, not for easy times. And during the Civil War, when the, the Confederacy was sending up spies and provocateurs to the northern cities to drum up draft riots, which were devastating the morale of the, of the northern states at a time when the Union was about to fall apart altogether. Abraham Lincoln knew who these people were, 
and they were arresting them when they came into the cities and holding them without trial because there wasn't evidence. They knew who they were. So he suspended habeas corpus. And Ju Justice Taney, who's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, said he can't do it. It doesn't matter. It does not matter that the life of the union is at stake. It doesn't matter that the lives of tens of thousands of Americans are at stake. You cannot suspend the Constitution. Yeah. Oh. As I said, that doesn't mean we can't have emergencies in this country, declared emergencies, and have temporary suspensions. But not for a year, not for two years. And by the way, you do democratic processes along the way. And then we got rid of, uh, you know, the, with the, the pro Fourth Amendment prohibitions against warrantless searches and seizures with all this uh, intrusive uh, track and trace, and you know we have to give our medical records in order to go into the into the public square, in order to leave our home. All of these things were against the American tradition, against the Constitution, and they should have been troubling to every American, and the, especially the press. And instead, the mainstream media in this country, which has always been the forefront of uh, the guardians and the protectors of our Constitution, particularly for its expression, free expression, all of a sudden, they forgot their role as, as the, you know, as the, the role I, which, I, which I learned at hand, that the role of the press is a posture of fierce skepticism towards government uh, proclamations. And they should have known that. You know, the New York Times had to, had to apologize to the American people for, for supporting for its role in the, on the run-up to the Iraq war, because they believed government officials. And, you know, and at this, they never learned the lesson, which is that we're, the role of the press is to speak truth to power, not to function as propagandists for the powerful. <laughs> I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about something that should trouble all Americans that we should ask questions about. And, you know, people are going to say the press, the mainstream media who's here today is going to report that I, you know, that I did a paranoid conspiracy theories, which is what they always say. <laughs> but I'm just going to tell you facts, okay? And then I'm going to ask you, are these things that we ought to be able to talk about in a democracy? Are these things that we ought to be questioning? Is that reasonable that we ought to be questioning? And the thing that I'm going to talk about is the role of the intelligence agencies in the pandemic, in, in, in almost every aspect of the pandemic, which itself, I think, should be surprising to most Americans. This is a public health crisis. This should be the province of NIH. Why are the intelligence agencies playing this role? Why is it that in the, in the organizational charts that were classified before they were declassified and handed over to VRPAC, which is the FDA committee that, you know, that, that ran Operation Warp Speed, and they declassified it in order to show it to that committee, so we now have it. Why is it that the lead agency in COVID planning was the National Security Council. Why is, it, why is it that the lead agency for operations was the Pentagon? Why shouldn't they be FDA and CDC and NIH? Why weren't they regulating the health crisis? And on the NSC, the, the, the chief security advisor of the NSC is Avril Haines. Now, Avril Haines has played a role in pandemic response for decades. And Avril Haines was, just so that you know who she is, she is the one, she was the deputy director of the CIA, and she's the one who masterminded the cover-up of the, of the destruction of the torture tapes at Guantanamo. And then when the, when the Senate was investigating those crimes, it's a crime for Americans to torture people. The CIA was bugging the Senate committee, 
which is utterly illegal, and she masterminded the cover-up of that crime. So, um, so she, and, and instead of being punished or criminally prosecuted, she was promoted to the highest spy in America, the Director of National Intelligence, the DNI, which means she takes the prime seat at the National Security Council. Where else have you seen Avril Haines? Well, if you read the last chapter of my book, which I think of on Fauci, which I think is the most disturbing chapter, it goes through this history of pandemic preparedness simulations that occurred beginning in 2001 and that predicted a series of pandemic. The one in the first one in May of 2001, which was called Dark Winter, predicted a smallpox attack on, on Washington. And this was five months before 9-11 and a week after 9-11 you had an anthrax attack on the US Capitol and on you know, media outlets around the country. And I think five people died, 22 people were infected. Uh, this was at a time immediately after 9-11. Somebody took the Patriot Act off the shelf. And let me give you a, a little background on this. We had a bioweapons program after World War II. And the first act of the CIA in its history was called Operation Paperclip, which was launched in 1947, about a week after the CIA was founded. So the CIA OSS had been dismantled after World War II because our leadership, Republicans and Democrats, agreed that having a secret spy agency was in inconsistent with democracy. Secret spy agencies were were associated in the American mind with the KGB in Russia, with Stasi in East Germany, with Savak in Iraq, uh, or in Iran, um, with, uh, with the Gestapo, et cetera. But they were inconsistent with, it, with the democratic system. So people were very nervous. People were very nervous on both parties about authorizing this. But in the end, Truman allowed it reluctantly and signed it into, to, to, uh, into existence. But it, as an espionage agency, which is spying, which is, which is information gathering, it's not dirty tricks. And that came later through a bunch of crazy machinations. But the first act of the CIA, the first project was Operation Paperclip, which, which was bringing the Nazi scientists who had worked on missiles, nuclear weapons, or uh, missiles, and bioweapons over to the United States to Fort Detrick and to some of the other um, high security labs in Texas and elsewhere in our country to, to begin developing a bioweapons program and to get the Japanese scientists, who were the only ones who would ever use, actually use bioweapons against the Chinese and killed many, many tens, hundreds of thousands of Chinese before and during World War II um, with bioweapons. And they had the most extensive program. And they got those uh, Japanese scientists also to come over to our country. And they op opened labs in Japan, which we occupied at that point, and developed bioweapons there. And the CIA was in charge with the Navy and some other Pentagon agencies of developing the bioweapons program. By 1969, they had achieved what they bragged about in the internal documents as nuclear equivalency. They could kill huge populations of people around the world at a cost of about 29 cents, cents per death, per life. This is what they were bragging about, nuclear equivalency. And, in, and so it was very, very dangerous. And a lot of people said we shouldn't be developing bioweapons. Why? Because once you develop them, you have now a blueprint that anybody in the world can use. So it is the poor man's nuclear bomb. Nuclear weapons, no matter, even if you have a formula, it takes huge economic commitments and technical proficiency to develop one. But if you have the formula for a bioweapon, you can make it in a garage. So, the, so the, a lot of critics within the Pentagon said we shouldn't even be doing this because what we're doing is we're making these weapons accessible 
the people who can use them against us and who have very, very low risk themselves. Um, and, uh, and so in 1969, Richard Nixon did something extraordinary. He went to Fort Detrick and he announced the end of the bioweapons program. Unilaterally, the American government was gonna stop developing bioweapons no matter what anybody else in the world did. And then three years later, they signed the bioweapons treaty with most of the major ne ne um, nations in the world and we're not gonna make bioweapons anymore. But there were this cohort of people within the CIA. The CIA, um, Nixon closed D Fort Detrick. They turned it over to NIH. But before they, and they destroyed all the bioweapons, but before they went, destroyed it, the CIA went in and got cultures of all of them and moved them to warehouses in New York and elsewhere. And then there were an angry people, group of people, in the CIA and the Pentagon, who for many years were trying to restart the program, and they began doing it illegally. The Russians found out they did it too. But they were doing it secretly, and it was very, very low profile. And in 2001, during the, after the anthrax, or after the 9-11 attack, the, um, they, somebody pulled off the shelf the Patriot Act, 342 pages, Yes, I want you to guess who the only member of Congress was who actually read that act. There was only one copy provided, unlike every bill. Everybody else voted on it without having read it. And one of the things that nobody knew was in there was a provision that did not directly revoke the Geneva Convention and the Bioweapons Treaty. The Geneva Convention made it a hanging offense, a, 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 a capital offense to do bioweapons development. But you could still do research. Right? You couldn't use a bioweapon under Geneva. So, but the bioweapons charter that Nixon said got rid of it all. You couldn't even study it anymore. And the only guy to read it was him. And what the Patriot Act said in this hidden provision is that yes, we still, uh, uh, we still ascribe to Geneva and we ascribe to the Bioweapons Charter, but any federal official who violates the, that, those treaties cannot be prosecuted. <laughs> That's what the Patriot Act said. So it restarted the bioweapons arms race. But the Pentagon was reluctant to do it itself because it was a hanging offense still. And in case there was, you know, the, the bioweb, in case the Patriot Act was, was, uh, was regarded as, you know, as irrelevant, was found to be irrelevant as a court, you were, it was a big jeopardy to start doing this. So they took the billion, $2 billion a year, $2.2 billion, and instead of doing it themselves, they sent it over to NIH, to NIAID, and they made Anthony Fauci the spear tip of bioweapons development in our country. And they gave him, they gave him a 68% raise <laughs> and attached to his military research. So he had to do this research. He had no choice. And then in 2014, when, uh, when uh, three of three of bugs escaped from those from his labs, and those escapes were highly publicized, and Congress had hearings on them, etc. Three hundred scientists sent letters to President Obama, begging him to shut down Anthony Fauci, and Obama ordered Fauci to stop all of his experiments. Eighteen of these gain-of-function experiments that were shut down by Obama ordered to be shut down in 2014. Did Fauci do it? No, he did not. He, he defied the president and continued with those experiments, but he began moving his operations offshore to China out of the oversight by nosy federal officials and by the Cambridge Working Group, which was the group of 300 scientists that had been alarmed by his labs. And they had written Obama saying, one of his bugs is gonna escape and it's gonna cause a global pandemic. So they started funneling 
uh, money to Wuhan, but it wasn't, you know, Fauci, I think, put a total of 26 million in there. But the biggest funder was USAID, which is a CIA operation. So it was the CIA that was putting money into, and, and DARPA, and, uh, uh, and other Pentagon agencies that were funneling the most money in for gain-of-function studies in Wuhan. And so then, I'm going to go back a little. During this period, and this is the, the chapter of my book that I think is most alarming to people, which is the, the CIA was sponsoring, beginning in May of, 20, of 2001, five months before the anthrax attacks, they sponsored a series of pandemic simulations. And those pandemic simulations involved, all of them involved, there were, all, there were CIA officials at each one, the CIA, they were James Woolsey, the deputy director, Avril Haines was at some of them, uh, many, many other CIA officials who I name in my book. The, and each one of them had something in common. They ignored the pandemic preparedness protocols that had been agreed upon by the CDC, by WHO, by the European Medical Agency, by the National Health Service in the UK, of what do you do in a pandemic? Because all of those protocols said you never lock down the public. You look for therapeutic drugs that are off the shelf and are effective against these diseases. You, you get people to, to strengthen their immune systems. Yeah. You quarantine by, with vitamin D and, and zinc and these kind, kind of protocols. You isolate the sick. You protect, you quarantine the sick. You protect the vulnerable but you let society continue operating. That's what everybody in the health field agreed upon. But the military and spy agencies had a different pandemic protocol, which is outlined in these series, and I, you know, I go through all of them in my book. And they were the inverse of what you would do of medicine. They were about locking down subjects, about using these pandemics as a pretext for clamping down totalitarian controls. Yeah. And the last one of these was in 2000, 2020, 20, or 2019 in October. And it was hosted by Bill Gates, by Fauci, and by Avril Haines. And, and interestingly, by George Gao, who is the head of the Chinese CDC in New York City, and any of you, I'm sure a lot of you have gone and looked at this on YouTube, it's called Event 201, and the, the fourth simulation that day, the last one, is all about how do you use the pandemic as a pretense for clamping down, for um, uh, uh, abridgments of freedom of speech, and particularly, how do you stop people from talking about a lab leak as the source of these virus? So this is in October 2019. Nobody, none of us at that time had ever heard of COVID. We now know that COVID was almost certainly circulating by mid-September. On September 12th, the Chinese government kicked down the door of the Wuhan lab, brought in General Wei to, to which is you know, the bioweapons expert from the uh, People's uh, uh, Army, to run the lab and removed all the gain-of-function studies from their public-facing websites and all of the genomic sequences from all the viruses. The Chinese government clearly knew that the virus was circulating in September. So a month later, you have this. That same week, Bill Gates, who was overseeing this simulation, made a bought a 1.1 million shares of BioNTech vaccine, which later became the Pfizer vaccine. He then sold that, all of that, almost all that stock, 87%, two years later as a, at a $242 million profit. And a week after that, he publicly announced the vaccine didn't work. <laughs> so this is what you call a pump and dump scheme. Because he was the guy who was on TV with his minion, Peter Hotez, who, got, who took $52 million from Gates for his institute, Gates made his institution. So you had the pair of them pumping up this stock for two years, 
and then dumping it a week before he goes on TV and says, oh, it didn't work after all. So uh, this event 201, George Gao, who's the head, who clearly at that point, if anybody in China knew there was a virus, escaped. It was him. He's the coronavirus expert from China. He's the head of their CDC. He's engaged in an hour-long discussion with April Haynes about how do we clamp down to stop anybody from talking about that this is a lab leak virus. How do we get the social media sites to censor people and deplatform them when they talk about that? April Haynes says, we not only have to censor people, we have to flood the zone. This is what she said, flood the zone with authoritative voices denying the lab leak. That's what happened. And the New York Times, which is in this room today, printed that as gospel. <laughs> I printed that. I, I, I'm not saying the reporter who was here. She did it. She's a very sweet person by all accounts. But the Times itself did, and it's irresponsible. It's not journalism. It, it is propaganda at that point. So, you know, what, what we saw was this involvement by, the, and then what happens? Vanity Fair. Um, the people are saying, well, where did the virus come from? The press is all saying, whatever you say, we know wherever it came from, we know it didn't come from the Wuhan lab. <laughs> right? So, so they, the government, Mike Pompeo, that was the head of the Department of State at that time. As we're we're going to do an investigation. He tells four of his agencies, find out where this is coming from. Vanity Fair does the article of what happened. Intel in, the, in, the, in spring, intelligence, all of these, these four groups from the department, from Foggy Bottom Department of State, are in a room saying, holy cow, we figured out that the very experiments that would, could have created this were being funded by NIH and were being done at that lab. And a guy comes in from the intelligence agency, Christopher Park, and says, shut it all down. We, can't, we gotta stop doing this. This is gonna implicate the US government. And despite that evidence in Vanity Fair, the American press continues to report it didn't come from the lab, when obviously nobody knew. So then a year later, the Republicans in Congress are saying to Biden, you gotta, you gotta figure out whether this came from the Wuhan lab. So Biden says, okay, we're gonna get the intelligence agencies to go look into that. <laughs> and who does he appoint to run that operation? Avril Haynes. Oh, she then publishes the, the whitewash saying, whatever happened, we can't figure it out. We, we do not know, and of course, I think it's 450 pages with 449 redacted or something like that, but I don't, I, I, I'm not gonna stand on that, but I know when it came out, that's what it was. So, you know, we need to ask ourselves, Americans, about, about you know, what is the role of public health? Who is supposed to be running public health? And why are the intelligence agencies have any involvement in public health? Let, you know, and, and at the same time, they've been practicing for year after year after year how to use a public health crisis to, to dismantle our constitution, to clamp down totalitarian controls. They did it right out in the open and it's all published. When, when COVID first hit, you know, where I live now in California, there were surfers on Zuma Beach, and the police were sent down there to get them out of the water, give them $1,000 tickets, and send them home so they could get COVID. Because <laughs> they weren't getting COVID out there. We knew by then that COVID spread indoors. And we know that vitamin D, which is sunlight, comes from sunlight, protects you against COVID. So what we were doing was the inverse of medicine. The same, you know, the health department in, in Los Angeles went down to Venice Beach and scattered sand on the, on the skate, on the half pipe, so nobody could, could skate on them to get them off the beach and into their homes. They went to Compton and they padlocked all of the basketball courts. And if they couldn't padlock the court, they removed the rim. 
And, you know, and, and they put people in a place where COVID was much more likely to harm them. And this is the only time in history, the only respiratory virus in history, where you would go to the hospital with symptoms of COVID and a positive PCR test, and the hospital would say, you go home, there's nothing that can be done. There's no early treatment. You go home till your lips turn blue and you can't breathe and then come back here. And each time they did that, it was a super spreader event. There, that has not, this was the inverse of medicine. And you know, we need, if we have illness in this country, if we have sickness, we need to have a medical response and a public health response and not a, not the response where Americans feel that their civil rights are being taken from us. We need choice. We, we need choice, we need freedom. We need a media that is gonna do, go back to its traditional role of speaking truth to power. I, I had a, a reporter last, last night say to me that she said, um, well, what if your words are misinterpreted by people? And I said, I said, that's not my business. My business is to tell the truth. And you know, Americans are adults. We're grown-ups. We live in a democracy. Part of the responsibility in, in, of living in democracy is figuring out what the truth is and then debating about it and thinking about it. And when the press thinks that their job is to protect you from dangerous mi misinformation, they are manipulating you. That is manipulation. That is not press. That is not journalism. It has nothing to do with journalism. The job of the press is to be the fierce, the fierce defender of truth, no matter what the cost of that truth is. And, I'm being given the signal now to sit down and, and shut up. So I'm going to say, I'll leave you with the last thought, which is that everything that we care about in this country, everything that made this country great, that made it unique, that made it an exemplary democracy, it all comes from one thing, which is freedom. And if we don't have freedom, we have nothing in this country. And there was a generation of Americans, and many of them were from this state, people like John Stark, people from right next door, Ethan Allen, and many, many others, thousands of people from this state who gave their lives during the American Revolution, who sacrificed their property, their wealth, their status, their relationship, so that we could enjoy the civil rights and the constitutional rights that, that made this country a great nation. And we cannot allow somebody to take those rights away from us. We have to be willing to make the same sacrifice that our ancestors made for us to make sure that our children enjoy those same rights, those same liberties. So thank you all for standing for liberty. <laughs>
And we are also the modern peace movement. And I think... I think that's where we truly have overlap. So I wanted to let everyone in the room know I have been collecting questions over uh, the past few weeks and last night on the campground. <laughs> and in the interest of time and logistics, I actually have a list of questions that we're gonna go through that way. I believe we have about 30 minutes before you have to mosey on again. And um, so I'm just gonna sort of start doing it. I hope the time works out. The first question actually does have to do with the modern peace movement. We, of course, everyone in this room really does love your anti-war uh, position. We also have a lot of activists in the state who are working on defend the guard legislation. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it is a bill that's been introduced that would say that Congress, who has failed us, who no longer declares war, what Defend the Guard would do is it would allow states to say that we will not send our National Guard to foreign wars. As president, would you support that or would you try to stop the states from doing that? You know, I, I have never heard that proposal before. I think it's a really interesting proposal. I don't want to cop out, but I, I would want to think about it before I gave you an answer, but I'm happy to give you an answer. I need to think about that first. Okay, do you, um, you know, how would you go about sort of reducing our footprint overseas and perhaps how could we uh, get out of this war in Ukraine? I think it's, quite, it's going to be quite easy to get out of the war in Ukraine. I mean, we now know, we found out in the last couple of weeks, that President Putin and uh, President Zelensky, our Prime Minister Zelensky, actually signed an agreement in uh, April of 2022, and, uh, and that the Russians were complying with that agreement. But they had already began removing their troops from around Kiev, and that uh, you know, Boris Johnson was sent there clearly, you know, at the behest of the White House to sabotage that agreement. And that's not the first time we've, we've done that. I mean, we, Zelensky, we, the, the, the involved nations, France, Germany, and Russia all agreed to the Minsk Accords earlier on. And pre in 2019, when President Zelensky, when Zelensky ran, he ran on the, on the basis of, a, of, of signing the Minsk Accords. He ran as the peace candidate. He got, this is a guy who is a comedian and an actor, which I'm not disparaging, because that's what my wife does, so I'm not gonna say anything bad about it. But he was not, he was not a, uh, you know, he was not a politician, a veteran politician. Why did people vote for him? They voted for him because he was the peace candidate and the Ukrainian people wanted peace. That's what they wanted. And as soon as he got into office, you know, Victoria Newland was over there pressuring him along with people from the ultra-naturalist right within uh, Ukraine to pivot and to walk away from the Minsk Accords. And, you know, we've now killed 350,000 uh, young men over there that have been killed in that war. And I'm not an apologist for Vladimir Putin. It was, it's a brutal war. It was illegal. He had other choices. But we also need to look at our role in, in the provocations going back to 1997. Oh, by the way, let me ask the second question. Answer the second question. How do we wind down the empire abroad? Yeah. Yeah. And the answer, you know, we have, uh, we have now 800 bases abroad. The Chinese have one and a half bases. I don't think the Russians, I don't know if the Russians have any now, you know, outside of the Ukraine. I don't know if they have any. And, uh, but we have, each one of those bases is a platform for future war. And we were told that, you know, in 1992, when the wall came down in, in Germany, and the Soviet, uh, and Gorbachev agreed to dismantle the Soviet empire, we were told we were gonna get a peace dividend. 
We were told that we were going to stop investing in billion dollars to health bombers that can't fly in the rain and that we would bring that money home to build schools and roads and, in, and infrastructure and help lower taxes and help, you know, help farmers convert to regenerative agriculture, all the things that we ought to be doing as a nation. Uh, but none of that happened. We, we were told that our military budget was going to go from 600 billion a year to 200 billion a year. And that would be enough to protect our borders, to arm our, ourselves to the teeth, to still be, to spend more on, on our defense than any other nation in the world. We spend today more than the top 10, next 10 nations combined. We spend three times what China spends. It's not good for our economy, it's not good for our national strength, and it has not helped American security or safety. We are much more, we are much more in danger because of those military adventures abroad with the reason we're going through, you know, I'm going to have to go through all these x-ray machines and searches today. I didn't have to do that before we got involved, you know, in, with these military adventures after, um, in the, you know, in the late 1990s in the Mideast. So it hasn't made us safer. It hasn't made us more secure. It certainly hasn't made us more free. Um, we need, we now spend, instead of 200 billion that we were promised, we now spend 1.3 trillion on all the military expenditures, and so that includes national security. So we have, I think, 8, 800 million, 880 million, 880 million pure military, 300 million on veterans, which we need to do, and then the rest of it on on national security at home. And you know, that is bankrupting the middle class in this country. Uh, oh. And, I, and I'm going to I'm going to wind down that I'm going to very very quickly I'm going to wind that down that and I'm going to start instead rebuilding our industrial base in this country and and focusing on giving Americans the freedom they need for entrepreneurial activity themselves. <laughs> of entrepreneurial activities, uh, our famous, favorite entrepreneur is actually Ross Ulbricht. So Ross Ulbricht was the founder of Silk Road. His mission in life was to try and reduce the harm of the drug war. He built a website and he allowed people to test their drugs, to pay with private money, and it was a way to try and reduce that harm of the drug war. I know at Bitcoin Miami, you actually did say that you would look into Ross's draconian double life sentence. This man was in his 20s, and you know they threw the book at him, they threw the Schumer book at him, by the way, and I was wondering if you've looked at the matter a little more and whether you'd be willing to go on record if you were president of the United States of America, would you pardon Ross Ulbricht? Uh, so, you know, as I said at the Bitcoin conference, if I, I will immediately investigate this when I, when I become president. I will, and I, if, if I find that uh, Ross Ulbricht uh, was punished as an example then I will give him clemency. Okay. Uh, uh, is that, that's not, you know, that is not consistent with American justice and it's wrong. Absolutely, and I want you to, I want you to know that that's his mother is here, she has done the human work over the years just to try and get the story out. Um, I will say from a personal perspective, I'm originally from South Africa, and I actually worked on the Nelson Mandela stuff back in the 90s when he was freed, and I think that we should think about this notion of Ross's role sort of in the world as something very similar, that he, you know, he should have international attention, people should understand that this was a grave, grave, grave travesty of justice. 
keeping in the line with sort of whistleblowers and uh, our favorite little rogue folks. Um, we also support whistleblowers fighting the system, people like Julian Assange, yes. who is literally being, <laughs> literally being tortured by, uh, by the system. And of course, Edward Snowden, who actually I invited personally to speak at Liberty Forum in 2016 from Russia. As president, uh, what can we do to help these people? How can we change this? How can we get back on the right track? Mm -hmm. How can we actually understand that whistleblowers play an incredibly important role and they should be heroes, not traitors? I, mean, I, will, I will pardon both uh, Assange and Snowden. Uh, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something. It's, it's stunning to me that the American press and all the publishers in this country are not uh, at the barricades demanding that Assange uh, gets released because Assange, <laughs> Assange isn't even really a whistleblower. He was a publisher. He just published, he published something. And, uh, and that means that anybody who republished what he published, which is the New York Times and everybody else, why aren't their publishers also facing jail? Uh, and you know, the, 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 the Congress has made this, the case for Snowden because Congress used the revelations that's, that none of us knew about that we were being spied on, and all of our personal data was being gathered and was being uh, archived by the intelligence apparatus, and nobody knew it, all illegal. And Congress was shocked to learn it, and Congress went out and passed laws to protect us against that. So, you know, it's hard to make an argument that Snowden did something that was inconsistent with the most deeply held and the most idealistic American values and, and personal courage. give you a softball yet uh, next um, no this is a softball would you consider appointing any libertarians to your cabinet <laughs> yeah. I'm for of higher. course I, you know I'm gonna appoint people I'm gonna I'm gonna have every kind of diversity in my cabinet and I want to hear I want to hear everybody's opinions and I you know all, I libertarians are so great for this country I don't always agree with everything that people say, particularly when it comes to regulating the commons. Um, but I, you know, it's, 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 these are people who understand the importance of critical thinking and are constantly reminding us of our most deeply held values. So they need to be listened to at every level of government. Now things are going to get a little harder. <laughs> uh, New, Hampshire, New Hampshire is a constitutional carry state, so we don't need a permission strip, uh, slip from the government in order to carry guns. Obviously, I'm sure you followed the, the discussions here about the gun-free zone. Uh, you know, you're our guest. We wanted to accommodate you. We, we worked with your stuff. But there are also 13 other states that no longer require a permit to carry a gun. Do you think the Second Amendment, because you were talking earlier about all these constitutional things, you know, and the Second is a big one for us. So do you think the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear arms free from government permission slips? Well, let me let me explain my view of the Second Amendment. I would um, I would probably uh, be supportive of a less less expansive view of the Second Amendment. I support the Constitution, and that includes the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court has given a very very expansive 
view to the Second Amendment, and so that's what we live with. And I think it's, uh, and my, I, I can tell you this, I'm not going to take away anybody's guns as President of the United States. I, I, I believe, you know, there, there is a terrible, terrible problem in this country with school shootings and, uh, and with other mass shootings. And we have to figure out a way, all of us working together, a way to deal with that issue. And, yeah, there's a, there, <laughs> I, I, I agree, I want to hear everybody's suggestion. I don't, I, I, I grew up in rural areas in this country. Um, I grew up surrounded by people who, who, for whom their ownership of guns was, uh, was almost existential in terms of their belief in this country. And I, it was so integrated, particularly into rural culture, that I don't, and because of that, and because of the very expansive Supreme Court uh, rulings about the reach of the Second Amendment, I think the capacity, even if there was one, to, uh, to reduce school shootings or reduce that risk by gun regulation just doesn't exist. And, it, and it's such a polarizing issue now, at this time in history, where all of us have watched all of our other constitutional rights under assault. And there's a lot of people in this country that rightly or wrongly believe that the reason that the Second Amendment is the only one that didn't come under assault in the last few years is because of the Second Amendment. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, and I'm, I'm not going to change that belief. And, and attempting to do so is just going to further polarize our country. And I want to bring people together. And I want to bring them together by focusing on the issues that, not the issues that separate us, but the values that hold us together, that we share in common. And those values, particularly at the top list of those values, is how do we protect our children? And how do we protect them from dangerous drugs? How do we protect them from the pharmaceutical industry, from, 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 from toxins in our food, and from gun violence? And I think, you know, what I will do as president is bring people together to talk about all the ways to do that. I have many, many ways to do that that I've thought about that my team is thinking of, but we want to include everybody in that discussion and reach those solutions through collaboration and rather than through antagonism. Awesome. And, and a comment to that, I'm sure you're aware of this, but with Big Harma, they, uh, you know, they don't want to look into the link between school shootings and RSS medicines. So, you know, I, I would encourage you to at least look at that link and then also perhaps as president commission some kind of something that we can look at because I think yeah. it's fairly clear there is some correlation and causation. Yeah, I, I've, I've, you know, I've looked at this issue and I've spoken to about it and, you know, of course, I, I take a lot of heat, which I don't care about. But the one study that I've uh, been able to find is a study that shows that about that, uh, tw that tw at least 23% of school shootings that the, uh, the shooter w had a history of SSRIs. That does not, that's, uh, that is a correlation. It does not prove causation. Uh, but it's clearly something we ought to be looking at, if only for the fact that the uh, that the, the the manufacturers inserts for those products say in black and white that they cause suicidal and homicidal behavior and ideation, and so there are other things that we need to look at too, which you know the, the role of video games, the role of social media, many many other things. Uh, but we we need to do that in a scientific, evidence-based way. This is what. NIH should have been doing. NIH is supposed, supposed to protect our children. Yes. It's impossible almost for a journalist to look into this issue because of the HIPAA laws. Mm -hmm. We can't find out whether those shooters were on SSRIs or not. And because of that, NIH is the only entity that can, that can pierce that and, and depersonalize the data and tell us the answers, and they won't do it. 
And I suspect they won't do it for the reason that they won't study anything else that is going to potentially <laughs> reduce far the mercantile interests of the pharmaceutical industry. Many free staters and many of us in this room, including myself, support secession. Now, I like to call it independence. The what? Secession. Uh, so, wait, seceding. So, um, by way of background, the Free State Project exists because we do not believe we can reform DC. We don't, th we think that ship has sailed. I mean, I'm excited about you. I think if someone can do it, it's probably you. So, you know, go do that. But, <laughs> but in the event that we are not successful with trying to stop what is happening in DC, we here in New Hampshire, many of us, but not all free staters, but many free staters support states' rights and we support independence because the federal government is out of control and it cannot be reformed. If New Hampshire were to secede, and we are on that path, we introduced CACR 32 last year. It was a declaration that was a constitutional amendment, which meant everyone in the state of New Hampshire would have to vote for it at 67%. And it was two lines, and it said, can we peacefully secede from the federal union? As president, would you use violence to stop us if we did it here? You know what? I'm going to, uh, I'm going to answer that question with the same uh, answer I give when people ask me about Taiwan, which is strategic ambiguity. Um, <laughs> I'll I, take it. I, I'm here. I, I'm running to bring our country together and to make people believe in their federal government again and to make people love our nation, to make us proud to be Americans again. Oh, I, uh, you know, I want to move forward on that rather than the options that are going to, you know, further fragment and atomize us. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I want to go forward with that kind of optimism. I want you all to be proud of this country the way that I grew up in a country that I thought was the best country in the history of mankind. I want you to feel that way about it. Um, so you said, I, I noticed they said we're out of time, so I'm gonna do two quick ones. CBDC, the, the central bank digital currency, yes or no? No! And then you said optimism, and I want you to understand everyone in this room is filled with love and unity and optimism, and we want to support you. I'm probably going to become your Hillsborough County chair, <laughs> and I'm a card-carrying Republican and a small L libertarian, so yay for unity. Um, thank you deeply for coming and speaking to us. Thank you for understanding that we are also a voice, that we are people who are intelligent, well-read, and we really do see the landscape for what it is. And I'm so, so thrilled and so honored and so grateful that you came and spent some time with us here in the Free State.